you have your Bibles, you open it up to Mark chapter 6. We're continuing our series in uh, the Gospel of Mark uh, today. Mark chapter 6. As we continue in our series, our call whenever we sit under the preaching of God's Word is for us to hear the Word. So our series this semester is for us to hear the Gospel according to Mark. That's what we're doing. We're listening to receive. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had exposition from Mark chapter 4 on the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is about the seeds going out onto soil and good soil and bad soil. And our responsibility this morning is to be good soil that we might hear and welcome and might experience the fruit of righteousness by God's work in our lives by his word. We'll be looking at the entire chapter of Mark chapter 6, but as we get started today, I want to just read a portion of the end of the chapter beginning in verse 45. Mark chapter 6, verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, he said goodbye to them, and he went away to the mountain to pray. And while in the night the boat was in the middle of the sea, he was alone on the land, and he saw them straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. Very early in the morning he came towards them, walking on the sea, and wanted to pass by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, because all they saw and were terrified. Immediately he spoke with them and said, Have courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were completely astonished, because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. Let's pray. Father in heaven, would you write your word on our hearts? May it be a lamp unto our feet. And even today, may we hear your voice. Would you cultivate our faith? It's in your son's good name we pray. Amen. Ryan Hutchinson preached the message just a few weeks ago on Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower. And he and Dr. Aiken and I were having lunch just a couple of weeks before he was to preach. And he was working on his message. And he said, guys, can I ask you for some advice? Can I get your help? I said, sure, you know, be glad to, to, to help you in any way we can. He said, I, I've got this passage. It's got all these parables in it. And I don't know how to tie them together. And Dr. Aiken, I, I, Dr. Aiken was at the table. I wasn't going to be the first one to speak. So Dr. Aiken jumped right in. He said, I've got the solution for you. He said, just talk fast. <laughs> I said, well, at, at least you don't have Mark chapter 6. In the middle of the chapter is the beheading of of John the Baptist. I said, but uh, how about this? How about if I help you and you help me? He said, okay, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I'll be back with you in a couple of days. So I showed up to his office a few days later with with a manuscript in my hand. And I said, here's a sermon on Mark chapter four. He said, this is great. I was running out of time. Thank you so much. And I looked at him and said, what do you have for me? He said, I've been given this a lot of thought. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been thinking hard about how I can help you. He said, I've got this sermon title, and if you go with my sermon title, it'll write the sermon for you. I said, great, what is it? He said, don't lose your head in ministry. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> don't lose your head in ministry. Have faith by keeping your eyes on Jesus. Mark is writing to the Roman Christians, a group of Christians at the hinge of the sort of the first group of Christians to the handing the baton off to the next generation. And he's writing to encourage them, likely in the face of persecution, encourage them to have confidence in the decision that they've made to follow Jesus. Mark tells this story in a breakneck pace. He punctuates the telling of his story with the word immediately, immediately, immediately. Jesus is on a tear of healing across Galilee, onto Jerusalem, and ultimately to the cross. The pace is quick. 
But there's another sort of literary device in the Gospel of Mark. There are all these questions that are raised, pregnant questions, points of tension that get raised as the story unfolds. And they're not quick answers given, oftentimes not direct answers provided. Sometimes the tension that's raised is left hanging. And we're in the middle of some hanging tension. At the end of Mark chapter 4, you have Jesus in the boat with his disciples. He goes down into the, the bow of the boat to sleep. And there's a storm that night, and the disciples begin to fear that they're going to capsize or, or to, uh, the boat's going to capsize and they're going to be lost at sea. They go down and wake him up and say, how can you sleep in the middle of all of this? He steps up to the top of the boat and he says, peace, be still. And in a moment, the storm is gone. And they look at each other and say, who is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. And this is the question that hangs over Mark chapter 5 and Mark chapter 6. Every word of the Gospel of Mark is written intentionally to weave together a story, the story of Jesus Christ, so that at the end of this Gospel, you and I are standing at the foot of the cross with the centurion saying the same thing that he says, and that is, surely this man was God's son. This is the call of Mark's gospel. The call of Mark's gospel is for us to take up our cross and follow him because we have been convinced that our hope is found in him and in no one else. Mark chapter 4, as we've already referred to, the parable of the sower and the, and the seed is a warning about ministry and the challenges of it is also a warning to us to be the good soil that receives the seed. And at the same time, the second half of that chapter deals with the hope that God is building a kingdom and that kingdom is going to come. Mark chapter 5 is about the power of God to heal and to cast out demons. It's also about faith. We see two incredible examples of faith in Mark chapter 5. The woman with the issue of blood who reaches out to touch the hem of the garment. And in a moment, she's healed, and Jesus says, who touched me? And then we have the father, the man who is a military leader, and he looks at Jesus and says, my daughter needs to be healed. And Jesus begins to make his way. He says, don't worry about that. Just use the authoritative power of your voice, and it will happen in a moment. And in Mark chapter 6, we are called to put our feet into the sandals of the disciples. The attention turns to us. You have this ad hoc series of stories in Mark chapter 6. It begins with the story about the prophet who was without honor in his hometown. And then it moves to when Jesus sends out the 12, two by two, into out to the countryside on a mission and tells them not to take anything with them, just two tunics and sandals. And then the story continues with the beheading of John the Baptist as a sort of an, an interruption even, a sandwich between, as the story's unfolding, this sort of interruption, this strange account. And then... We have a returning where the apostles come back to Jesus and they report on the mission that he sent them on and what they saw. And then from there, we have the feeding of the 5,000 and then Jesus walks on the water. The purpose for the telling of John the Baptist's beheading in this passage is to tell us that ministry is dangerous. But the dangers of ministry are not that we would lose our head. The dangers of ministry is that we would have hard hearts and not have faith. The dangers of ministry is that we would, be, we would astonish Jesus because of our lack of faith. So don't lose your head in ministry. Keep your faith by keeping your eyes on Jesus. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 6 is a story uh, as it begins here, you have Jesus returning to Nazareth. 
And what we learn in this passage, uh, this part of the passage, is that faith is undermined when we resist living in light of who Jesus is. Our faith is undermined when we resist living in light of who Jesus is. If you look at Mark chapter 6, verse 6, it says that he is amazed, talking about Jesus, at their unbelief. We like for people to be amazed by us, but this is not the kind of amazement we would want. We don't want Jesus to be amazed at our unbelief. Jesus is in the synagogue. The people are astonished. Jesus is astonished in this passage, and the people are astonished. The people are astonished about what he's saying, and they begin to express doubts about his words, about his works, and express doubt about who he is. The rejection of Jesus here is not a rejection about his ideas. The rejection of Jesus is about who he is. He's preaching in the synagogue, doubtless with the same kind of authority and the same boldness, the same kind of clarity, the same power that we've seen him preach before in the Gospel of Mark. He's declaring that the kingdom of God has broken in. He's calling them to repentance and calling them to, to faith. He's striking, preaching, provocative, preaching, unsettling, preaching. And the crowd begins to wrestle with the authoritative nature of his word and his mighty acts. You can hear the chatter. Maybe the Pharisees were right. Is he doing these by the prince of the demons? By the devil, does he cast out these demons? You see the questions that they're asking here. In Mark chapter 6, verse 2, when the Sabbath came, they began to teach in the synagogue. Many heard what, what he was saying. They were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom that he has been given to him? How does he do these miracles performed by his hands? And they don't stop there. The hostility continues not just by what he's saying and what he's doing, but the hostility continues about who he is. They attempt to validate their hostility by raising questions about who he is, demeaning him. Isn't this the carpenter? I mean, he's a menial laborer. This is not the material of a Messiah. Then it continues in the juicy tidbits of isn't this the son of Mary? I don't even give him enough credit to talk, call him by his father's name. It would have been uncommon in that day for anyone to be referred by the name of their mom and not the name of their father. They took offense at him. How dared this local nobody assume such airs? He may have been able to swindle those pushovers down in Capernaum, but... He can't waltz in here and talk to us that way. I mean, we know his brothers and sisters. We watched him grow up. Our kids played with him. We know his family. We're not buying this. You see, they had no grid for the answers to the questions that they raised. Where did he learn these things? He didn't learn them. He received them from his father. He's the one full of grace and full of truth. How did he get this wisdom? He is the wisdom of God. How does he do these things? He does them by the power of his own will and according to his own plan. Don't we know his family? It depends. He is the only begotten one from the Father. He says, who are my brothers and sisters? My brothers and sisters are the ones who do the will of my father. You see, they didn't have the grid to answer the questions that they were raising. The reality is we could assume, we could assume that this passage is about unbelievers. It no doubt applies to unbelievers, but I'm not sure that Mark's primary focus is on unbelievers. This gospel is written to the church. It's written to disciples. The remaining portions of chapter 6, it's all towards the disciples. Mark's being clever here. He's drawing us in. 
our tendency would be to, how can these people be so rude? But he has his sights on you and I. You remember where it ends in Mark chapter 6, verse 51 and 52, where he says, and they were astonished because they didn't understand about the loaves. That's a warning for us. We can think we're doing well. We, can, we know all we need to know about Jesus. We're comfortable in the church. We're comfortable around church folks. The question is, do we obey his word? Do we trust his works? Do we live in light of who he is? As these stories continue in Mark chapter 6, verse 7 and 13, we see that faith is demonstrated by dependence upon Jesus because we have heard his word and we have obeyed his word. Jesus sends his disciples out on a mission, and this mission requires dependence. He organizes them, he gives them authority, and he instructs them to take nothing. If you go on a mission trip here at Southeastern, you'll, uh, you'll get, a, you'll get a, to, a, a list of things to pack from Dr. Hildreth. You're supposed to take your mosquito repellent and take a first aid kit and make sure there's Pepto-Bismol in there. Make sure that you take a couple of pairs of pants and a t-shirt for every day, clean socks. Pack your tennis shoes for traveling, some walking shoes from when you're there, and make sure you have some nice shoes just in case contextually you need to, you need to dress up one day. When Jesus is looking over the shoulders of the disciples when they're packing their bags for their, for their mission trip, and he says, uh, wait a minute, not so fast. I think you misunderstood me. I don't want you to pack all that stuff, just two shirts and sandals, a couple of shirts and flip-flops. You don't need a roller bag, just get a, just get a, uh, a backpack. You're going to go under my authority with my message, and I'm going to provide and that's what happens here. He sends them out under, with his authority. Look with me in verse 7. He summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He sends them out by his authority. That means there's no, there's no uh, negotiation. There's, there, 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 there's no talk about whether we go or not. He sends us, we go. But he also sends us with his authority. And that's part of the provision. Keys of the kingdom, the power of the gospel, empowered by the Spirit. We go under his authority and we go with his authority. It's a delegated authority. And this is both to humble the overconfident. The mission that he sends you and I on, he doesn't send us on because we're sufficient for it, but because he's sufficient for it. And to assure the timid and the weak. The mission he sends you on, timid one, he doesn't send you on it because he thinks you're sufficient for it. He's sufficient for it. We go out with his authority, under his authority. We go out to proclaim the message of, of repentance. And we go out completely dependent upon him. He says, he says, don't pack food, couple of tunics, sandals, go out. Wherever you go, find a place to stay and stay there until you leave. The message is clear here. The application is clear. <laughs> we depend on Jesus when we're sent by him on his mission. I like to do things with my hands. I like to build things. And the reason I like to build things is because I get it in my mind's eye. I get a, a, an idea of what I want to see and I want to see it happen. So I go get the materials that I need to build. I pull out all the tools and inevitably I pull up a YouTube video. Okay, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it. Even when it's my idea, I have to get somebody else's help. Even when it's my project, I have to get somebody's help. How much more when it's his mission? It's his work. 
that he's sending us on. We depend on Jesus when we're sent by him and his mission. So the question is, are we living in dependence upon him, upon his authority? And if it's not easy enough for us to answer the question, it might be because we're not living sent on his mission. Your agenda day in and day out, your agenda, or is it his agenda for you? And the text tells us he'll provide for all of our needs. We go out under his authority and with his authority. Mark chapter 6, verse 31 and 43, we see here the feeding of the 5,000. We see in the feeding of the 5,000 that our faith is tested by our limitations, but it's comforted by Jesus' sufficiency. There's two themes here. That the, 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 the faith of the disciples begins to stall, but Jesus' provisions remain. And their faith is renewed with assurance of Jesus' provision. The Bible doesn't shrink back when it's telling this story about our own weaknesses. Look with me in verse 35. When, the, when it drew late, the disciples approached him and said, The place is deserted. It's already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countrysides and villages to buy themselves something to eat. And then down in verse 38, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Well, when, we, when they found out, they said, five and two fish. The passage is, makes it abundantly clear that the disciples were not sufficient to provide for the people. The weaknesses is clear, but guess what? As, as, as clear as the weaknesses of the disciples in the moment the unmatched greatness and provisions of Jesus is clear in the moment too. He's great and his provisions are revealed by his compassion, by his faithfulness as a shepherd and by his sufficiency. We see his compassion, verse 31. He said to them, come away by yourself to a remote place and rest for a while. He's caring for the disciples. He had just been out on a mission. Then in verse 34, when he went ashore, he saw the large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then verse 37, you give them something to eat, he responded. And they said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worthy of bread? Give them something to eat. He said, how many do you have? And then he instructed them to have all the people sit down. He was going to provide for them. We see his sufficiency in his compassion, but we see, also see his, his sufficiency in his faithfulness as a shepherd. In verse 34, it says, when he went to shore, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he began to teach them many things. This is a powerful phrase, to be sure. And it's got an important Old Testament backdrop. And I am running out of time, so I have to do this quickly. It's first used in the scriptures in November in Numbers 27, verse 17. Moses, who is praying for the for the Lord to appoint Joshua as his successor to lead the people, he says this: for otherwise the people will be a sheep, will, sheep without a shepherd. And then the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34, verse 5. God explained that his people were scattered in the exile like sheep who have no shepherd. And then in Ezekiel 34, 23, he says, The time will come, God says, when I will set up over them a shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he will feed them and be their shepherd. And this is what we see. Jesus steps into this moment and says, I am the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd that satisfies them. Mark marks this when he tells us in verse 39 that he makes them sit down in green pastures, reminding us of Psalm 23, that the, the Lord is our shepherd and he leads his people into green pastures. And then we see a sufficiency in the fact that his provision satisfies people. They're satisfied. Jesus satisfies their hunger Again, Mark, in, in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd and I have no want. And they, in fact, have no want. 
And finally, the story that we read as we began just a few moments ago, the story where he dismisses the, the disciples. The disciples have seen Jesus rejected. They, they've been sent out two by two. They've just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people, 5,000 men, probably as many as 12,000, upwards to 15,000, with five loaves and two fish. And now the disciples find themselves in another trial. And this is intentional here. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of them, him to the other side to Bethsaida. And while he dismissed the crowd, in John's gospel, we're, t- we're told that at the end of the, the feeding of the 5,000, that the crowd were, were so elated and so excited about what they had just seen, recognizing his power, they seek to make Jesus a king. John 6, verse 15 says, perceiving, talking about Jesus, perceiving they were about to, to come and take him up by force to make him a king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So Jesus sends the disciples away and begins to to, to go back into the mountains to depart for prayer. He needs to get away with his father to stay focused on his mission. He doesn't come to be a military king or a political savior. He's brokenhearted because the people don't have a leader, but his way is the way of the cross, not the way of a political leader. So he goes and he gets quiet before his father. The mention of prayer is here in the text is significant. It's a clue. Three times in Mark's gospel, Jesus prays. He prays in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Mark chapter 6, verse 45, and then in Mark chapter 14, 35 through 39. And in each of the prayers, we have the, a common scenario. It's at night. It's in a lonely place. The disciples are removed from him because they failed to understand his mission. And in each case, Jesus faces a formative decision, a formative moment about his mission. And in this moment, following the feeding of the 5,000, by his prayers, what Jesus is affirming is his calling to his divine sonship as a servant and not a political leader. The servant that Mark 10, 45, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. At the same time, though, he's testing his disciples. He sends his disciples out onto the boat. And when the disciples were apart from the Lord, they struggled at the oars against the wind and in the darkness. They're struggling, making hard way into the, into the night. The disciples are struggling against the wind at night in the Sea of Galilee. Much of our lives are just like this. We're like these men on the lake that night. And in this room, there's multiple circumstances and situations that it's, you could describe it just like this. It's like I'm in a boat struggling to make headway. Can you imagine what these disciples were thinking? This was his idea to get in the boat, and he didn't get in here with us. Now he's left us to our own devices. We could, have been, we could have been on the shore snoozing. That's what we wanted to do. We didn't want to get in this boat. We too are tempted to think in these moments, where is he now? How often the, these sorts of situations occur in the Gospels. This must be an important fact that Jesus wants to teach us, wants us to come to terms with. Jesus waited three days before he went to the tomb of Lazarus. He told the famous parable of the unjust judge and the widow who had to pester him until he finally relented. The Lord's ways with us are so interesting. He could have. He could have stayed on the shore and just calmed the seas and made it an easier way for them, but that's not what he chose to do. He wanted them to see him deliver them. He wanted them to see them deliver them. He wanted their faith to be strengthened by his presence, by knowing him and by trusting him. So what does Jesus do here? 
He reveals his incomparable glory and his faithfulness and his enduring presence with his people. Two phrases you can't miss, and we'll wrap up quickly. The first phrase phrase is this, he meant to pass by them. And the second phrase is this, it is I. He meant to pass by them, verse 48. He saw them straining at the oars because of the wind was against them. Very early in the morning, he came towards them walking on the sea and wanted to pass by them. What was he doing? Was he playing a game with them? He wanted to sneak by them, kind of meet them to the other side? Did he just want to wave? Hey, guys, how are you doing in the boat? I think there's a better explanation. The explanation is he wanted to reveal himself to them. When this phrase is used with respect to divinity in the scriptures, this is an epiphany. The incarnate son is, 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 is revealing himself even fuller to his disciples in this moment, much like that, that takes place in the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the deliberate moment of Jesus to identify his di- his deity. This is like what God does with Moses in the Exodus when, when, God, when Moses hides in the cleft of the rock and God passes by to reveal his, his loving kindness and his patience and his goodness to them. Jesus is walking by to reveal to the disciples who he is. He passes by his disciples so that they may see him. Jesus comes to reveal the, his glory. Jesus is revealing his transcendent majesty to these disciples in order to assure them. He displays his identity that they may know and marvel and trust in. And this is why he says, it is I, fear not. This also is expression is the echo of the Exodus. Moses at the burning bush. Who do I say sent, sent me? I am sent me. This is exactly what Jesus is saying here. I am. It is I. This is not merely a successor of Moses, like Joshua. This is not just another shepherd for the sheep. This is God himself. And he's wanting the disciples to see him for who he is. The chief shepherd, the one who parted the Red Seas, is walking on the water. Jesus is revealing his glory for their faith in four hours. Jesus is saying here to them, the most important thing about your ministry is that you go forward with me. And he's already a pro- and he promises to us that he will do that when he sends us out. Lo, I will be with you always to the end. In closing, let us remember this. We're never out of his sight. And when he is with us, we are never to be afraid. Yes, we know his presence when we know our insufficiencies for what he's called us to do. But in his presence, we have faith. Yes, we take our eyes off of Jesus, but guess what? He never takes his eyes off us. Yes, we forget sometimes our confession, but he never forgets us. Jeremiah, in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22 to 24, he says, Because the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. And these new mercies every morning, the new mercies are not fresh baked bread on the counter when we wake up. The new mercies are his presence in our lives and his power at work in us. He says, it's the Lord is my portion, therefore I'll put my hope in him. So, when we wake up in the morning and the first, our first thought of God is, he's saying, it is I. When we open up the scriptures and we read his scriptures, he's saying, it is I. When a friend speaks the gospel into your life in a challenging circumstance or a challenging situation, Jesus is passing by. It is I. When he faced the headwinds of life and God doesn't disappoint, he's passing by. It is I. Verse 
And my prayer for us, even in this hour, is that we have seen and heard. It is I. Do not be afraid. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for your presence. May you build our faith in the knowledge of you and that we see you. In your son's good name we pray. Amen.